All right, I think we're uh, right about the time that we should kick this thing off. So let me uh, let me do exactly that. Um, first of all, welcome to the uh, second event in our MBN speaker series for 2021. And you got to remember that this series has been going on since uh, 2004. And if my recollection is correct, our very first speaker was a guy named Joe Dumars, who'd had a great uh, great uh, uh, career with the Pistons. And at that time we had him in, he was, uh, he was their general manager. So a little bit about our audience. You know, we've got a very good percentage of our guests that are uh, registered for this webinar. And uh, of course, many more who are watching us live on our website and also on Facebook Live. Uh, we know that, uh, that we will have a very healthy audience uh, that will be picking this up on our website at a later date. And I thank you all for uh, jumping into this, uh, an ever expanding and ever growing audience. Uh, if, if, uh, if this modus operandi has brought us anything, it's expansion, um, bigger audience, more long play, what they call in the news industry, it's got legs and, uh, and of course a wider variety of attendees. Now, uh, just by way of, of, of homework or uh, uh, I guess housework, uh, if you lose your connection to the webinar, then you can uh, rejoin using the same unique link in the email that you used to join initially. If you want to just come back in through Zoom, um, the meeting ID is 829-4332-1182. And the passcode is 036326. So you can jump back in that way as well. It uh, goes without saying that these things do not happen without our sponsors. And we always want to acknowledge them knowing that we can't really acknowledge them enough. But we want to thank Kettering University for, for being one of our sponsors. And they've been our sponsors. It's, it's not just because they were generous enough to supply our speaker as well, uh, but they saw the value in it and have been with us as a sponsor for a little while. Shaheen Chevrolet, who I think has been with us since the beginning, as has Dean Transportation, uh, Capital Region International Airport, Fly Lansing, uh, been with us a long time as well and, and very important to our community as an economic driver. Sinair, one of the great corporations housed here in, uh, in Lansing, and uh, of course, BNC, uh, PNC Bank as well. They've been a big part of this series as we move forward. Uh, C2AE, and you're going to hear from some of these people when we move uh, into the community roundtable. And uh, LAFQ, as well as MSU International Business Center, uh, Broad College of Business. So we, we're thankful for our sponsors and uh, in particular those that have been with us for a long time. Um, as is tradition, as you know, for the speaker series, uh, we're going to go around uh, to several community leaders. If we were meeting face to face, we'd be running around the room and they'd be in the room uh, and we're going to get an update. And here is a set of pre-recorded videos that, uh, that we have gathered for this event's uh, community roundtable today. So first up, we're going to have Victoria Meadows. She's the Vice President of Marketing and Communications at LEAP, Lansing Economic Area Partnership. So Victoria, take it away. Thanks, Chris. Oh, so much. And um, I just want to say thank you. And, and it's been quite a year, hasn't it? Um, you know, like many people uh, watching today for LEAP, this marked an entire year this past week of remote work. And economically speaking, this past year was tumultuous <laughs> across the board, but particularly for small businesses. And the Lansing region is truly a small business community. Um, February was a big month for LEAP. Uh, we started off by distributing more small business survival grants. 194 businesses received grants last month, but um, you know, it was nowhere near enough to to, to fulfill the need in our small business community. We've been very grateful and thankful to, to receive funds over the past year, both federal and state funds. Um, and, and we've distributed nearly $10 million in, to 678 small businesses in our community. Um, of course, as with everything that we do at LEAP, this takes so many people and so many partners in the community to make happen. And, and we're very grateful for the community organizations, businesses, and members, LEAP members that, that made it all possible. 
And of course, we're ready if and when more funds for small business recovery come our way. Um, additionally, last month, we received for the seventh year in a row a vital gateway grant from the state to support our tech state tech startup gateway programming, where we work with, with partners across the region to successfully attract and grow high tech businesses and jobs to the region. Um, on the business attraction front, Leap's attraction pipeline is full of a diverse array of industries from manufacturing to tech to agriculture and active and underway projects and leads have the potential to bring over 1500 jobs and nearly 300 million in private investment to the, to the region this year. So that's great news. And then we officially launched our department, a new department at Leap, uh, called the Department of Equitable Economic Planning, or DEEP, and we appointed Tony Willis as our Chief Equity Development Officer. And you can expect to hear a lot more about how LEAP is partnering across the region uh, through DEEP to address the inac economic inequities interrupting our region's prosperity. And finally, next week, LEAP's inclusive entrepreneurship initiative, one and all, will, will graduate 100% of its second program cohort. And we invite everyone to join us live on, on our Facebook page Thursday, March 25th at 6 p.m. to congratulate and learn more about these up and coming entrepreneurs and to catch a special keynote from Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist. So together, we're hanging in there, always together. And I, I, I thank you for, for giving us this opportunity to share some positive th things LEAP has been working on to help us get there. Well, listen, Victoria, as usual, LEAP is diving in with both hands where help is needed. We appreciate everything you do too. Victoria Meadows from LEAP. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna move right now uh, to Tim Damon across town to the Chamber of Commerce. Tim? Hey, thanks, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and uh, share a few updates from the Chamber. I, I think uh, in kicking it off, one of the things that we're, uh, we're seeing is a lot more positive outlooks and, and trends from a lot of the regional employers. And so we kind of said, you know what, COVID kind of, kind of guided us over the last, you know, 12 months, and now it's time for us to kind of take a little bit more control of that and not let COVID control us. And so I think we're beginning to kind of see a lot of folks looking forward, and so that's very encouraging. You know, a couple of uh, highlights from the chamber, some things we're working on. We're in the middle of our Voices of Small Business campaign, and uh, we launched this uh, about a month ago, and that's highlighting uh, sort of the resiliency and the innovation, the creativity, the the leadership of our region, small businesses, and really trying to bring some awareness to their stories. And so we've had uh, folks on there from, uh, you know, mobile food trucks to uh, to gym owners to even some tech companies to PR companies and what and how they've navigated the last 12 months. Uh, the stories are uh, they're they're just amazing. And when you hear that from from some of the small business owners, follow our social media, you know, threads and our and our website if you want to take a look at those videos. But we're doing a great job of getting those out into the community. Uh, the Relaunch Greater Lansing initiative continues to move forward. Uh, we continue to provide a lot of resources for employers and kind of moving into this vaccination phase. Uh, our good friends with Detroit Regional Chamber did a statewide survey recently that showed 81% of employers statewide uh, feel that vaccination of their employees will be critical to restoring some normal business operations for them, but yet only I think it was 39% had a plan to really effectively communicate with their people. So earlier this week, we launched an employer, it's a vaccination communications campaign. And part of that is an employer toolkit to really help uh, businesses continue to find ways to, out, to reach out to and communicate with their people. There's uh, part of the toolkit, there are frequently asked questions on the vaccine. There's a business preparedness uh, checklist. There's a vaccination checklist. Um, there's a sample survey to your, to your employees as well and trying to really move people beyond the hesitation of getting vaccinated. And then the second part of that, and one that we're really excited about is this Trusted Voices interview series. And we're working with a lot of business community, education leaders, uh, and really answering a lot of these frequently asked questions around the science and data of the vaccine development and really trying to dispel some of those myths. And again, trying to encourage people to feel comfortable uh, getting out and getting vaccinated. Because again, I think the employers are telling us that it's going to be important for them to get back to normal business operations to have their people fully you know, fully vaccinated and everyone feeling safe and coming back to work. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we joined with a number of our statewide chamber partners in the Reopen Michigan Safely Coalition and really designed to encourage the, the governor and MIOSHA to begin thinking about not extending, 
but modifying some of the remote work office closure uh, restrictions that have been in place. The date is April 14th, I believe. April 4th, yeah, it was April 14th where uh, it could get extended or it would expire at that time. And so there's indications that it could be extended another six months. We're trying to say is like, how do we remove some of those restrictions and begin giving some employers the opportunity to begin working with their people and returning to uh, the office and what that looks like. For us here, it's really unique is with state government being our largest employer. So any given day, downtown Lansing, having 20,000 state employees down there, kind of fueling and driving that downtown economy. And so we're kind of looking to the state to say, you know, what's your return to, uh, to work plan? And we think in our region that can really provide a leadership role in making a lot of our employers feel comfortable with what now they're going to bring their people back. So, you know, more to come on that, but we certainly feel there's great benefits of getting people back in the office from that innovation, uh, the creativity, the teamwork, and, and not to mention the, the mental health aspect of people working remotely and feeling isolated and that stress. We're all feeling it. I feel it, you know, so, so we're all feeling that. And so again, uh, a lot of good work being done there with the number of the business groups around the, the state of Michigan. Really quickly wrapping up our Athena program, Elaine Hardy is our 2020 uh, recipient. And I said that right, 2020, I know it's 2021, but COVID pushed a lot of things back. And so, but we're recognizing Elaine on Thursday, March 25th, and it's gonna partnership with WLNS TV6. So it will be televised, we're excited about that. And probably most excited is Thursday, June 10th, the Chamber's annual dinner, outdoor venue downtown at the baseball stadium at Jackson Field and a lot more details information that come in that. But, we're hoping that by June 10th, we might be able to really kind of welcome the business community uh, back in, the, in downtown Lansing at the baseball field and celebrating some of the success. So appreciate the opportunity and thank you for all you do for the community. Well, and thank you for all you're doing down there at the chamber. And I noticed you're focusing on what is our most valuable resource, our personnel, get our people back, get them healthy, get things going. So thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. Next up, and uh, I'm happy to say I just used his facility the other day. Uh, Rob Benstein, he is the interim director of the Capital Region International Airport and uh, just flew out of there last week, as a matter of fact. Rob, what's happening at the airport? Oh, thanks, Chris. Hello, everyone. Happy to share some good news this month. Uh, our February passenger traffic was up almost 20% compared to January. The airlines are actually starting to see uh, an increase in bookings for the spring break and summer travel periods. In response to this, American Airlines is bringing back their Washington DC service on April 2nd. So that's earlier than we anticipated. Uh, they're also gonna be adding another five weekly flights to Chicago O'Hare, so uh, more good news there. Uh, cargo traffic continues to be very strong for the months of January and February. We were up 14% over the same period last year. So uh, the cargo business and UPS continues to do very well for us. For 2021, we expect uh, traffic to be about 55% of what we saw in 2019. Uh, while that's still low, it's a lot better than the 38% we saw in uh, 2020. So uh, looking forward to some, some better numbers coming up. And I appreciate everyone's attention. And if you have travel plans in the near future, please fly Lansing. Thank hey, you. Rob, Rob, before I let you go, uh, tell me about uh, cargo. Is cargo holding up? Cargo is doing great. Uh, yep, we were up uh, about 14% for the first two months this year. Excellent. That's good stuff. That's wheels up and wheels down, right? Yep. A lot, a lot of freight going through here. So That's important. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that for the update on the airport. Um, next up in the community roundtable is uh, Mark McDaniel. He's the CEO of Air. So, Mark, what's going on with you guys? Well, thanks, Chris. I always appreciate you uh, asking me to you know, come on and talk about what's happening at Sinair. Uh, we're, uh, there's a lot, there's always a lot happening with us. We don't sit still very long. Um, our most kind of big, big news here is that we just were notified by the U.S. Treasury through their Community Development Finance Institution area that we got a $4.8 million grant uh, that we're going to be able to use um, in our footprint to uh, promote what we do, and you know, and it's it's programmatic money that is has flexibility to it uh, that we'll be able to use for housing, housing initiatives, uh, and other community facility initiatives. And it's uh, we've been we've been suc very successful using that to leverage other funds. So that that 4.8 won't just be 4.8. There'll be more money that we can leverage uh, to bring in to do do our work. 
Um, you know, we're, we had a, ended up having a great year last year. We thought it was going to be a horrible year, um, but a lot of things that we, we put in place in March when we shut everything down, uh, we were, I think I'd say we were surprised at first how smooth it was. And within 36 hours, everybody was working full steam and we've been able to stay that way ever since. Uh, a lot of had, a lot of that, the results of our year, the results of um, uh, going into this year being so positive is that we put our team members first. Uh, we were very concerned about their wellness, their mental, not just their wellness, but their mental wellness and recognizing the, the issues you have in working remotely. Uh, constant, constant engagement and communication. Um, we just uh, actually yesterday for St. Patrick's Day, because it's a big day for me, sent out a message to everybody is that we, um, we gave everybody um, a, a large sum of money. I won't say the amount, but it's significant. Every single staff person, didn't matter at what level you're in, everybody got the same. Uh, uh, for all of our managers and everybody else through the organization, the executive team, myself and that, we didn't get it. We gave it to all the rest of the members. Um, so when things like that is, we, you know, you, you got to take care of your people first, which makes you successful at the end of the day. Um, you know, it's so interesting, Mark, as we run around on this community roundtable, there's one recurring theme, and that is your people. I mean, yeah. it really is. Everybody's taking care of their people, getting them back. That's, as you know, our most valuable resource. Thanks, buddy, for the update. We appreciate it. We appreciate the fact that uh, it's really great when a company can thrive and be doing good for the community at the same time. And that's what you guys have done. Thanks. That's, that's why we're here. All right. Perfect. All right. We're going to move to the next uh, community roundtable speaker, uh, Jason Quartz. As you know, auto sales is always uh, a really good trend to watch uh, if you're going to predict the uh, economic circumstance. So Jason, with that, Jason Quartz, uh, what's happening at your dealership? Thank you, Chris. And I'll give you a little update on Shaheen Chevrolet and Shaheen Cadillac. Um, pretty fortunate here. We're, we're still busy, uh, but I'll tell you, inventory uh is is getting a little tougher and a little tougher uh the plants locally have been shut down uh and they're going to be shut down for a couple weeks uh because of this chip issue and they're thinking that things are going to be a little tough uh over the second quarter um and third quarter we should be getting back to normal but i'll tell you um i just want to tell everybody out there that you know you still got to maintain your car We've got an eight bay quick loop and tire center. And uh, with the potholes out here, I know our governor is doing her best to do, to take care of our roads out here. But uh, ultimately when you come in for an oil change in a tire rotation, they check your alignment, they check your brakes, they do a multi-point vehicle inspection, they vacuum out the car, you get a car wash, everything's included just to get you back on the road. So right now, if a new car isn't the right time, let's keep your car maintained and uh and having cadillac on our campus has been fabulous so just glad to be here on south lansing and uh looking forward to spring well it's good to have you on buddy and thanks for your continued support in this uh, speaker series and and other places of course you guys do a great job but i i don't want to do a commercial for you but maintenance of your car will make it last so much longer and run so much better it's just simple maintenance Take Simple maintenance. A lot of people don't understand that 20% oil life index. A lot of people are going further and further. You still have to check your oil every now and then. We've had a few cars come in here at a 7,500, 8,000 miles and they're out of oil. So please check your oils about every three, 4,000 miles. Those are great words to live by. Check your oil, America. All right. <laughs> thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. All right, and next on the round table is uh, Ahmed Kurja. He's Associate Professor of Marketing Department at the Broad College of Business at MSU, also the International Business Center and Global Edge. Uh, Ahmed, what is happening in your neck of the world, which really, really consumes the whole world when you think about it? Thanks, Chris. Thanks for inviting us. IBC has been very busy with a few new initiatives in the past couple of weeks. One of them is the new global mindset at Broad College. 
uh, we're working uh, on an app that will allow students to collect points for participating in international events and education abroad activities. Uh, and we have new, two new uh, global business club events that are coming up, and that is related to the ongoing focus on China, US trade, economic, political relationships. Uh, the first one is about, it's a panel on US, China, Africa relationships. And the second one is another panel on US, China, Central Asia. So um, please uh, follow us on our website. We're gonna send out uh, messages, information about these, and we'll be glad to see, see you uh, in one of these panels or both. So Ahmed, people can get involved by going on your website. There's an invite there. Yep, IBC at msu.edu, or we're going to spread it out as much as possible. Uh, and you might get, a, get an email um, from us if you are on our uh, mail list. Well, besides being on the uh, uh, cyber board for a lot of years, I've attended these things over the years and they are really fruitful. I mean, even if you're not doing international trade, it's good, good background for your own businesses. So Ahmed, thanks for being with us and thanks for the great work you do out there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for being, for supporting everything we're doing. Thanks. Well, we do love what you're doing. Uh, next up, uh, Bill Kimball, President uh, Infrastructure Leader at C2AE. Bill, you guys are always on the leading edge of the economic curve. What's happening with you guys? Great, Chris. Yeah, I appreciate being here. And uh, want to talk a little bit about economic development. Certainly the federal government and the stimulus package that was just passed uh, is going to pass some of those dollars to the local governments across the country. So we're seeing that as a very positive thing, uh, not, you know, to help them, you know, recoup some of their budgets that they lost, but also uh, pop opportunities for some sewer and infrastructure and water uh, infrastructure that's needed, you know, badly needed. So the other thing that's economically development that we're watching closely at the, uh, again, the federal level is a national stimulus bill, which uh, stimulus infrastructure specifically, and that infrastructure bill would, you know, be for roads and sewers and, and all kinds of uh, aging infrastructure that we know that we have in Michigan, as well as uh, obviously uh, across the nation. So uh, yeah, economic development on the, you know, also on the manufacturing side for us, uh, we're seeing our manufacturers still, you know, produce and expand their plants to meet uh, the demands, you know, during the pandemic. So that really hasn't slowed down for us at all. So, yeah, I appreciate, uh, you know, what's happening, uh, again, at the state and uh, federal level. Excellent stuff. You guys are uh, not always on, on the front end of that recovery, but you're also on the back end in that everything you built then has to be, you know, inspected and looked at, et cetera, et cetera. I'm glad you guys are, are healthy through this whole thing and uh, appreciate that update, Bill Kimball from C2AE. And uh, now next and final speaker is Kelly Ellsworth Etchison from LaughQ. Kelly, um, what do they always say about you? Show me the money. Thanks, Chris. We absolutely have money to lend. And so make sure you guys come out. We've got money for businesses. If you need access to capital, come see us. We have uh, great rates on our loan products, credit card products. So be sure to come out and see us. For those of you that have kids or grandkids in high school, we have our Right to Educate scholarship going on right now. We're going to be giving away four of those. So be sure to tell someone that you know. Uh, check out LabQ. Absolutely, and, and again, thank you for your support, not only in this, but for over the years. You've been, you've been very supportive of the Michigan Business Network, and we deeply appreciate it, so thank you. You're welcome, my pleasure. All right, Kelly Ellsworth Atchison from LabQ, uh, and I think that concludes our roundtable. So next order of business. Next order of business, like it or not, is me. And we are back. So we want to thank uh, all of our sponsors and all of our community leaders for that roundtable. A um, little bit of uh, further uh, housekeeping. If you have any questions for our speaker today, you can submit them in the chat room. And uh, we've got someone that will be running them to me and we'll deal with them at the end of the presentation. And speaking of the presentation, uh, Dr. McMahon is our speaker today, and he became the seventh president of Kettering University in August of 2011. Kettering, formerly known as GMI, General Motors Institute, is one of the nation's premier engineering, science, 
and business universities. Dr. McMahon has extensive national and international speaking, consulting, and management experience in organizations and initiatives related to technology, product development, research policy, investment capital, entrepreneurship, and innovation-based economic development. He's spoken and consulted with national and international organizations interested in innovation policy, investment capital, technology-based economic development, university research, and the university's role in economic development at the invitation of organizations, including the National Academies, the US Congress, and the Federal Reserve, as well as a number of international governments. So we're very fortunate today to have with us Bob McMahon, President of Kettering. Uh, Bob, take it, take it away, and thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. Thank you uh, for having me today. And thanks for everybody for being here. Um, after an introduction like that, I should probably say thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? And Lee, my father always said, when you make the sale, leave the room, you can only lose it from there. So, you know, when they get an introduction like that, but no, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here, especially during these challenging times. I mean, we've all had challenging times over the past year. I think back where I was a year ago uh, right now and, and looking forward from that point, none of us could have anticipated all the things we had to deal with. And it's been especially challenging time for higher ed in general. But Kettering is an amazing institution. Do, do I have, or my, or do I have slide? Okay, I'm supposed to say, Wade, first slide, please. There we go, how about, and now we can go to um, the second slide. It's been a, um, it's been a real challenging year for all of us, but Kettering is truly a unique institution in uh, higher ed. You know, we're, we're blessed in Michigan having many outstanding uh, universities, public and private. And when you have such large, uh, outstanding public universities, sometimes the, the specialty schools and the, and the, and the, and the others, uh, you know, are fall somewhat in the shadow. But in the case of Kettering, Kettering is truly a national jewel of higher education. It's unique in the United States. It's unique among institutions worldwide. And in fact, is a model in many places, uh, in many countries for how they want to structure some of their higher ed offerings. Next slide, please. Um, we are a uh, specialty school. Like I said, we're a, a STEM specialty school. So we specialize in science, technology, engineering, math, and business. And we have about 2,500 students. We are uh, unusual and highly unusual in that we have a four-year cooperative requirement and a culminating undergraduate experience, a thesis for all of our students. Um, and whereas when the university was founded, cooperative experiences, internships are, were very unusual, now most universities offer some form of cooperative experience or internships for their students. And that, and that is truly uh, uh, wonderful and, and progress. The thing when we talk about Kettering though, you have to kind of suspend what you think or what you think you know about cooperative programs because we use the same language, we use the same word, but it's a very different experience for our students because we truly have the nation's most highly integrated cooperative program in a four year uh, nationally ranked university in the, in the nation. Next slide, please. And we're known for this worldwide. And this, and this model not only extends to our undergraduate residential programs, but we actually have significant global offerings through Kettering Global, an online university, and Kettering Global X, which is our certif certification and professional development arm of the university. And we receive the same kind of national and international accolades for those programs as we do for our undergraduate programs. Uh, next slide, please. We, our difference become, goes back to our founding. We were actually founded to be different by the group of individuals who came together uh, to form the, who were seminal in the foundation of the U.S. automotive industry. Flint, where we are located, of course, is the home of General Motors. And it was many of the principals of that company who came together to found this university. Next slide, please. 
Um, and they did so because long before McKinsey uh, issued a report on the war for talent and, and, and talent pipeline became a buzzword, uh, they understood that uh, the supply of talent, the supply of technically able, technically educated uh, 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 workers would be a gating, would gate their progress and their ability to grow. So as part of the founding of the company, they came together to create a school. Um, and they did so on a different philosophy of education. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, attributable to Charles Kettering, one of the founders of the institution. And I think it captures better than anything else the spirit in which we were founded. And that is, is if we taught music the way we try to teach engineering, we would end up with all theory and no music. What I tend to say is if, you know, if, if we taught engineering, if we taught um, uh, music the way we taught uh, engineering typically in most programs, we would make people study 12 years of music theory before we ever let them touch a piano. And of course, that's ridiculous on its face because we all recognize that mastery, other than as distinct from learning, mastery of a discipline or mastery of a technology or an art requires the not only the mastery of the theory of what of the domain, but also uh, experience in it uh, and the coupling of those two to create true mastery. And this was really the basis on which this university was founded. We can't become truly, truly fully enabled as engineers or scientists unless we have experienced the application of our discipline in equal measure to the acquisition of the theory of that discipline. Next slide, please. And so on that basis, this university was originally founded in 1919. We celebrated our um, centennial year two years ago now as the School for Automotive Trades. It was not originally associated with GM. Uh, it was an independent school that was founded to educate this workforce that was needed by this industry. We've gone through Gosh, we've gone through about seven names <laughs> at this point in time uh, as we've as we have uh, changed different, you know, as as we've evolved. But the basic underlying principles of how we have operated remain the same. So we transitioned to the Flint Institute of Technology. And then finally, as General Motors recognized, formed and grew and recognized that an enormous amount of their talent and their leadership was coming from the university. The university was actually acquired by, uh, by the company and operated as a division of General Motors as General Motors Institute until 1982, when the university became a private not-for-profit institution. Um, it was renamed in 98 Kettering University um, in honor of one of our founders, Charles Kettering, one of the great inventors in, in our, uh, of our country. Uh, next slide, please. And should you ever wish to explore some of this legacy, the original birthplace, the Factory One, has been uh, was acquired by General Motors a number of years ago, and we worked in partnership with them to create a really a state of the art, amazing archive of early automotive history in Flint. Uh, it's on the it's a part of the National Park System, in fact, um, and there are incredible physical and the other artifacts in the collection, including the, the first automotive battery, the first automotive electrical system, because Charles Kettering was known for creating the automotive starter, but one of the things that cars didn't have before the starter was a, an electrical system. So we had to invent that as well. So all these pre pieces and parts are there uh, in, in the archives. And as we were a leader in automotive over our history, we're now a leader in mobility, uh, the evolution of automotive to include a wide range of technologies and, uh, and uh, enabling um, systems. And this university was really ideally positioned to take a leadership role in mobility given our long history with the, uh, with the automotive industry. And we are among the leading institutions in the region and in the country in educating um, 
students and educating professionals in these emerging disciplines and uh, uh, not just the hardware and software and control systems associated with um, new um, uh, mobility systems, but also in all the peripheral domains around ethics and human factors and, and the things that go into making these technologies successful. Next slide, please. We've made a number of investments in this area, including uh, the, uh, the Mobility Research Center on our campus. We see a picture there. Um, many of us know about M-City and uh, Mobility Research Complex at University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Kettering has its own proving ground on campus um, of, of approximately the same size as the M-City complex. Ours is designed to satisfy a complementary and somewhat different need than the M-City complex. The uh, Kettering Research uh, Center, Mobility Research Center is really an engineering test bed. So we focus on things like communication systems and vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure communication. As part of this, we're the only university in the country to own and operate its own 5G cellular communications network in the town. We have cell towers in Flint that are used to communicate with autonomous vehicles both on and off our uh, research site. Uh, next slide, please. The Mobility Research Center was part of our engagement as well in the Flint and Flint redevelopment and in fact sits on the original Chevy in the whole uh, factory, GM factory site in uh, Flint. And as part of that redevelopment, we've created greenways in collaboration with the park system in Genesee County and the city, created greenways and pedestrian areas and that have really re energized the whole region of the downtown area of the city. It's a greened up as well as creating a high technology cluster. Next slide. We are unique because we were founded on this different philosophy and the in expression of that philosophy is a different delivery. Um, we operate 12 months a year. We don't have summer terms. We don't go on holidays. We have a two week break in the summer and that's about it, much to the chagrin of many of our staff and faculty. Um, we, when a inter class enters the university, we split them into two cohorts and these cohorts enter a 12 week on 12 week off rotation in opposition over the course of their four to four and a half year tenure at the university. They are on campus for 12 weeks where they are in a highly rigorous, very, um, very challenging engineering curriculum and science curriculum. Uh, and then after those 12 weeks, they enter a rotation where they are placed in one of almost 600 corporate partners uh, in a professional paid role in that organization. So our students, so experience, the experiential component of their education is treated as of equal weight to the acquisition of the theory. They spend as much time in that as they do in the classroom in this rotation. And as all of us who've been in business or been out in the world, out of the university for a while, know deeply many of the things that we learned that we needed to know and how to function in our roles we that knowledge we gained through experience not in sitting in the classroom so this really reinforces uh what you what we've learned and what the students learn in a very very enriching way next slide please indeed we were formed to create a virtuous circle between the cooperative experience and the classroom experience. So the dynamic in a Kettering in a Kettering classroom is often very different than you'd find at a typical university, where there's direct feedback between what the students have learned in their cooperative experience as a practicing engineer, as a bench scientist, and what they're learning in the classroom. In a Kettering classroom, you'll often hear a professor say, you know, uh, Jane, what did you, you know, we're talking about the mass transfer equation, but in your role as an engineer in this company's wind tunnel facility, how do you use this? Is this how you do this? And so you get this kind of a feedback between the two and that drives educational outcomes. Next slide, please. We top this off, this program off with a jointly advised senior thesis, which 
And many institutions would be kind of at a master's level of work, which is jointly advised by a member of our faculty and a professional at this cooperative sponsoring institution for the student. So this is usually addressing a problem that the company has um, that the student has been working on in their role in that company. So it forms, it actually comprises a form of tech transfer back to those companies. Next slide, please. The result of all this is one of the nation's finest STEM institutions with consistently high uh, outcomes. Now, universities as a rule are typically assessed by the quality of their inputs. What is the, what is the GPA of the class it's entering class? What's the SAT scores or what, how much money is going into the university and research? When you start to look at universities in terms of their outputs, Kettering comes to the top, meaning we are always among the highest ranked universities in the country in terms of return on investment for a degree among the outputs, uh, among the, the earning potential and mobility, economic mobility of our graduates, et cetera. Next slide. And we see that consistently in the nature of the individuals that come out of our program and what they go on to do. Next slide. In fact, uh, Wall Street Journal recently ranked us as number one in the nation for, comp for un and universities who prepare students for, for their careers. Uh, next slide, please. But more importantly than these accolades, I think one thing I'm particularly proud of is the economic and social mobility that comes from this form of education. Um, if you look at this microfiche chart, which you can't um, really read on this, but I'll, let me just, I'll just summarize it for you. This is a listing of the economic and social mobility that comes from a Kettering degree and it was done by uh, The Economist a couple of years ago. And they look at how does, the, how does the experience of different students from different institutions impact their lifelong mobility, economic and social mobility. And among uh, the highly selective universities in the country, Kettering is number one. Now, if you look at these, you see institutions like there are institutions like Harvard and and Yale and the like are in this list. But Kettering is consistently number one across this. Next slide, please. And if you look at across the nation, some 2,000 institutions that were assessed across the nation, Kettering is number seven in terms of economic mobility. What this means is, is the, the ability for our students to move upward and to become socially and economically mobile is greater than almost every institution in the United States as a result of this and something we're very, very proud of. And it's for this reason, next slide, that we invest very heavily in underserved students and advancing underserved students in the STEM pipeline. We have a number of nationally recognized programs for uh, inspiring students to engage in STEM education, um, as well as we've developed programs such as a first community robotics center to engage students in, um, in first robotics and VEX robotics to inspire uh, their, uh, their pursuit of careers in the STEM disciplines. Uh, next slide, please. As part of all of this, we've also been very aggressive in community redevelopment in Flint. Next slide, please, because we teach the um, we teach as part of our curriculum the professional obligations of service because we believe very strongly that we have an ethical obligation in our disciplines which we model as an institution next slide please i get one more slide there we go um, as to our covid response you might be interested um, we had made significant investments in uh, virtualized education and, and in uh, professional development of our, you can go back one, um, in professional development of our faculty around um, 
around uh, virtual delivery. And so when COVID hit, we were able to rapidly pivot to a fully virtualized delivery system. In fact, we, we virtualized the entire curriculum in less than two weeks um, uh, in March of last year. We were one of the first, also one of the first universities to return to face-to-face -face education in early July of last year. And we've now uh, successfully completed three academic terms with face-to-face -face delivery on campus with all the appropriate protocols and monitoring and tracing and all those systems in place to ensure the safety of our community. Okay, you can go ahead. Next slide, please. All this is preparing us for what the, you can go back one. Um, all this is preparing us for new models of education and how education and higher education delivery is going to change going forward and into the future. Okay, now you can advance, please, Wait. thank you. Uh, and these have implications not only to virtual learning, but also to the physical makeup and physical design of campus. And one of the things that we are doing on our campus is we are currently in construction of a state-of-the-art academic space, which we call the learning commons, but which really is a new conceptualization of uh, academic spaces uh, that will support this 21st century delivery and curriculum across all of our programs. Next um, slide. And finally, which uh, I'm coming close to my end of my time here, because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to touch on, was asked to touch on, is this: is the talent, is the development of talent and the talent pipeline. Um, I could speak for hours on that topic and not even begin to touch the surface. Um, but for, for all of us, the development of a ta talent pipeline is not only critical, it's actually existential for many of our businesses and, and the technologies we're trying to develop. Um, we are, I believe strongly that we and the model that we represent are fundamental to the ultimate solution of, of how we solve that problem. Because, and you can go to the next slide, um, because the Kettering education at its core emphasizes two attributes which I think are absolutely fundamental to professional success in, in these disciplines. Um, one, higher education has to be able to teach, has to be focused on teaching students how to teach themselves because disciplines, technologies are changing so rapidly that a significant uh, portion of the knowledge that a student will acquire on the, um, you know, during their time at a university will be obsolete a few years after they leave. So rather than teach specifically, you know, uh, data, the, the curriculum really has to be oriented on creating individuals who are self learners and can self and can, and can upgrade their skills continuously over their lifetimes. And the second piece, of, the second thing that I think is important is how to handle failure in your professional pursuits, how to be resilient to that. The first piece gives you agility and the second piece gives you, res gives you resilience. And I think those are the two attributes of a graduate that are, um, that are most impactful over the port part, uh, over the, uh, over their career. And in fact, I think they're, the, it's where the Kettering educational model excels, truly excels in delivering to our students. So thank you. I hope that's, that's a, this is, Chris, this is a real challenge to speak in 20 minutes on such a wide range of topics. Normally I can't get my name out in five minutes. So that's, uh, so I look forward to questions. I think you're muted, so I'm not. No, I think I was, sorry. I thought it, oh, I was an automatic. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I know it's not enough time. Uh, I would also say that we have more questions than we're gonna have time to answer. So we'll try to get back to you for answers that we will then re-perpetuate. Um, so let's get right to them. Can you tell us about Kettering's auto drive team and the 2021 Collegiate Cup? 
Well, they, they, we were very pleased. They won the 21 Collegiate Cup, our auto drive team, and uh, they have been selected for the second round, uh, the auto drive challenge, which was a, a, a very, very competitive, uh, you know, comp it was a strong competition among institutions to, and I think the ultimately eight were selected for that. We were very pleased that our team was selected for the initial round. And they've actually been selected for the second round um, out of that. So we're very, very pleased. The, um, I love the auto drive competition. I love the, the philosophy of it and then that it is not showing them how to do it. It is, they are doing it. Our students are doing it. They're being mentored, but they're responsible for it. Bob, it's that practicum side that's made Kettering so famous. Um, uh, Kettering University works with MEDC occasionally. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that relationship? Well, I'm very I'm honored to sit on the executive board of the of the MEDC, and uh, and I think uh, and and we do have a number of, uh, of ways in which we work with them directly in local, regional economic development to help to help provide resources to them. Our mobility research center is uh, open to companies across the state to use to employ and and in in collaboration with us. Um, and I'm a very strong proponent, as you said, from my introduction, I, I, a background that really has emphasized the university's role in regional economic development as an engine of regional economic development. So I believe very strongly in a, in a close ties to organizations like the MEDC. Um, so this one is you covered a bit, but uh, can you tell us how often do the co-op experiences lead to graduates eventual jobs? Uh, I think this always speaks to placement, which I have. Yeah, to about uh, you know our our placement rate for our graduate for our graduates um, vacillates wildly between ninety nine and one hundred percent every year, um, and the, the typically you know pre COVID I had, don't have the post COVID uh, numbers, but but pre COVID the typical senior I think the average was something like four job offers. Uh, per student with the first usually coming in the junior year. The students are, are in high demand. I think the, the last number I saw was that roughly 40% of the students, 40 to 50%, somewhere in that range, of students uh, graduate, take a job with their co-op sponsor, sponsoring organization. Crazy stuff. Um, last month's speaker was uh, uh, Tom Kelly from Automation Alley uh, in Troy, and, and, and they're asking, do you pair with them, in, in, and how do you feel about Industry 4.0? Uh, we do. We do work with Automation Alley. Uh, in fact, I was on the board for a number of years, and uh, the I think, you know, when it comes to automation, uh, when it comes to um, the Industrial Revolution 4.0, I, I really do believe and I'm from, I'm originally from North Carolina. Uh, and North Carolina has been pr pretty progressive in how it's employed universities and, and, and economic development. The thing about Michigan and about this area, I, I can think of very few areas of the nation that are better equipped philosophically and technically and educationally to, to excel in this new environment. Um, it really is contingent upon us to put all the pieces together uh, in ways that um, uh, that uh, that that take advantage of those those links. And Automation Alley is one of those organizations that does that. That connects the dots. Well, I'll tell you what. The final question here deals to uh, uh, with how is Kettering uh, your educational model dealing with the talent gap? And I and I think you pretty much answered that in your presentation, but. Uh, I think I think the talent gap. Uh, yeah, it, it's like I said. It gets, you could spend hours on that one topic. I think that the big, the big, um, the big gap in our thinking about the talent gap is that we think about it only in terms of the end of the process. The talent solving the talent gap is really a supply chain problem, uh, and it's and we need to treat it as a supply chain problem. Not can we capture the people coming out of college or out of high school, but students start to make decisions that impact their ability to do work, to, you know, to, to be an engineer or to be a scientist. They start to make those decisions in 
eighth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade, that's where they start making them. And they start making them in the negative, not in the affirmative. You know, they, they make them in an environment where, you know, maybe they're, you know, they're not receiving the kind of encouragement from their, their teacher about, about mathematics or about the importance of certain curricula. And so they start to withdraw and engineering and science disciplines are, are, they build on each other. You can't take calculus before you take algebra and you can't take algebra before you take trig. And so if you withdraw from the pipeline in sixth grade, you get to 12th grade and you can't, you can't join it, you can't rejoin it. So if we're truly going to solve the talent pipeline, we have to think of it as a supply chain, treat it like that. That's one of the reasons we invest heavily in FIRST and in our community engagement and many of the things we're doing with elementary education and pre-K education even in Flint to support the development and inspire those students to continue to, to engage in the things they need in order to, to, uh, to ultimately uh, become an engineer or scientist. Yeah, I also love how you're, um, how you're speaking uh, to that, that part of the community of need because that's, that's where we really got to make our progress. Bob, thanks so much for joining us. It's, uh, it was an incredible presentation. What you guys do up there is always, uh, I've always been in awe of. So thanks for oh, sharing. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for the opportunity. And thanks to everybody for your attention. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, again, I want to thank our sponsors very quickly. Uh, Kettering University, uh, Shaheen Chevrolet, Dean Transportation, Capital Region International Airport, Fly Lansing, Sinair, PNC Bank, C2AE, LAFQ, and MSU International Business Center, and Broad College of Business. Our next virtual event will be uh, April 20th, 1130, and our speaker will be Bill Beekman. You all know is the uh, Athletic Director of Michigan State University, and you can bet that his information will be current because it changes every 48 hours. I uh, want to thank you to my MBN team for navigating a uh, uh, a brand new adventure with these virtual events, Sarah Mosier, uh, Mike Steibel, uh, Wade Tong, and, uh, and Jeffrey Mosier. And finally, want to thank, as always, all of you uh, for being part of the 2021 Virtual Speaker Series event. Uh, and if you want to go back and watch any of this or, or care to share it uh, with your business associates, please go to michiganbusinessnetwork.com. It's all right there. And by the way, you're able to pick up MBN podcasts now on Spotify, as well as iTunes, uh, Google Play, SoundCloud, and others. These additional platforms are allowing us to expand even further the size and the geographic scope, scope of our audience. So thank you all for being part of this. We appreciate Dr. McMahon again. Uh, have a safe and uh, to all of you, a very prosperous month. Thanks for being with us.